All right, guys, round three. Let's finish this up and get sectionalism in the books as far as the notes and lecture goes. Uh, we left off bleeding Kansas. People are literally fighting in the streets um, over voter fraud uh, and the issue of slavery, whether it's going to be allowed in Kansas or not, who's eligible to vote, all kinds of things are going on. Uh, hopefully you watched the video uh, that I posted yesterday about Bleeding Kansas, kind of gives you a little bit more detail about the craziness that was going on. Uh, excuse me. We are going to continue on to another big kicker in the whole sectionalism idea. This is the Dred Scott case. Uh, Dred Scott is going to be a slave um, in Missouri, and he was actually owned by a U.S. Army officer. So because this guy was in the Army, um, he moved around from state to state to state as his postings changed, uh, and, and Dred Scott went with him, of course, and, and at some points, the Army officer was posted in states that did not allow slavery. Um, Illinois, Wisconsin, two examples. They're free states. They don't, they don't, they don't allow the slave trade. Um, slavery is not, it's not so much outlawed, really, as it is just not there. Like, you just can't do it. Um, so when Dred Scott's owner, he dies in 1846, uh, and Scott says, look, I'm going to sue in court, and I'm going to say, I'm free. My, my, the owner didn't set him free when he died. Uh, he passed him on to whoever was next, unfortunately. But Dred Scott says, look, I'm free. I lived in two states that were free, where slavery is not allowed. I should be um, allowed to be free. Now, the issue that arises here uh, is two things. Um, it goes to the Supreme Court, and the court um, looks at this case and unfortunately makes a, what I find to be a very poor decision. And what it is here is Judge Taney looks at this, he's a Supreme Court justice at the time, um, and he makes two different rulings on this case. The first, he determines that slaves are not citizens. Uh, since they're not citizens, they are considered property, uh, and property cannot sue in court. They are not people, quote-unquote, under the law. Uh, so right there, Dred Scott's case is done. Uh, as a slave, he doesn't have the right to actually sue in the courts um, of the United States. So Dred Scott loses his bit for freedom. He goes on to say, Judge Taney does, uh, that Congress has no power to limit uh, the expansion for slavery or of slavery. Now this is interesting because the Dred Scott case was focused mainly on freeing uh, Dred Scott because of his location, because where he went in the United States that was free. Uh, but Judge Taney takes it a step further and says, hey, Congress can't even act on this. This is not something that, that the, the legislative branch can actually limit or expand. Um, it's based on strictly the states and the upcoming territories. So this was a huge win for the South because it, it meant that no longer was legislation like equality in the legislature uh, that big a deal because now they couldn't vote on it one way or the other. Um, so if the free state comes in, that's all well and good. That doesn't really change the fact that slavery will continue in the South since the court said that the legislative branch, Congress, cannot affect um, the expansion or the retraction of slavery. Um, Dred Scott is is pivotal here because it, it, it gets in writing this this idea that slaves are not citizens and that Congress has no power. It was a two part thing and and really this is this is eighteen fifty seven when this happens. This is three short years before before the nation's gonna split into a bloody civil war. This is really kind of a kicker. This really upset a lot of the abolitionists uh, it really, it really galvanized their movement, and and we're gonna see uh, in the next slide someone that really took this this ruling and and ran with it, so to speak, um, to an extreme. Uh, and it's an extreme in this case, but it, it's 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 like the Kickstarter of what is gonna be uh, an extreme war um, here in just a few short years. So after the Dred Scott case we have um, the issue of John Brown, which we talked about before. Old Brown was a, he was a radical abolitionist. He was, he was vehemently 
against slavery in all its forms. Um, and he was willing to fight, to kill, and die for that belief. Now, when I say radical, I mean like literally, he would kill you if you support slavery. Uh, and he was, he professed he was ready to die fighting for the cause of freedom. Um, not a bad thing in this case, right? I mean, he, he, he took a stand and we shouldn't, we should have been able to get past this without bloodshed. Honestly, you know, as, as a nation, hopefully like as we move forward today, modern times, uh, we see that bloodshed is not the best option. We can fix things, um, a little more calmly, right? Bloodlessly. Um, better debate and discussion, uh, less clubs and gunfighting, but I digress. Uh, John Brown is going to attack a place called Harper's Ferry. Uh, it's an arsenal, which is an arsenal just means it's where they house weapons. It's a federal arsenal um, that has a lot of guns, cannons, gunpowder, ammunition, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and Brown's plan was to gather these arms and literally arm the slaves so they could rise up and revolt and free themselves. He had a, he had a small group of, of men with him, uh, including his sons, uh, that attacked the ferry. They killed the, or excuse me, attacked the, the arsenal. They 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 killed some of the army people there, uh, and they hole up in in the arsenal. Now, the plan kind of falls apart here because the the uprising that he that he foresaw that he he believed would happen when he put out this call it just didn't happen. The the, the the slaves didn't run from the fields and then go arm themselves. Um, excuse me. So he just kind of, now he's just holding an arsenal with a very small group. Um, the, <laughs> the militia comes out and, and, and a regiment of Marines. Uh, and Robert E. Lee is going to be the one who leads the Marines. Uh, Lee is going to play a pivotal role in, in the South's success, initial success in the Civil War. Uh, he's probably one of the greatest um, Civil War generals ever. Um, so Lee is is in charge of this group, and, and they reattack the ferry, and they kill or capture all of Brown's men. They capture John Brown himself, and and it's it's a bloody nasty ordeal, and it really brings national attention to the issue of slavery and and the extremes that people are willing to go to uh, to fight for and against this institution. Um, John Brown is going to be found guilty of treason. He's going to be hung. Um, he, he broke the law, right? He, he attacked a federal arsenal. Now, whatever his intentions were, as pure as they might have been, right, his... his his desire to end slavery, a good thing, the path that he took to get there was illegal and costly. It ended up costing him and his sons their lives and, and all of his men. Um, just like Uncle Tom's Cabin, how it kind of showed people, hey, there's stuff going on that we didn't really realize, um, John Brown and, and his willingness to fight and die for the cause really really focuses attention on slavery and, and it kind of kickstarts um, the abolition movement, right? And, and kind of makes them get a little more willing to to literally fight. Uh, but at the same time, the, the pro-slavery forces in the South, they, they see this and they realize that they are going to have to fight at some point to maintain their way of life. Uh, and so both sides kind of realize that, that this is not going to be an issue that's going to be settled peacefully or easily. Now, they don't think that the fight will be long and bloody like it ends up being, but they do realize that it's going to be a pretty pretty nasty affair. Um, so, John Brown, this happens in 1859, October of 1859. Um, the Civil War is going to start not even a full year later, really. Um, Abraham Lincoln is the Republican candidate running for president, uh, and he's running against several other people. There's a Southern Democratic pres or candidate named Breckinridge. There's a Constitutional Union 
uh, representative named Bell. There's a Northern Democratic uh, candidate named Frederick Douglass. Uh, and, and, and the vote goes, interestingly, just about the way um, the Civil War is going to divide the nation. If you'll look at the map there, California and Oregon and the northern states, the three states, pretty much vote for Lincoln across the board. Um, the slave states, they pretty much vote for Breckenridge. And then Douglas and, and Bell kind of split those middle states, the border states right there. Um, and this election, it, it was a big one. Uh, it, the turnout was pretty good because people realized that what was on the table here in this election, the, 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 the very nature, the very direction that America was going was dependent upon this vote. And slavery was really the primary issue of the 1860 election. It was a hot topic. It, uh, it, was, it was what everyone was talking about. You know, all these things that had built up and built up, these compromises, and then, and then the Dred Scott decision, and then John Brown and his, his attack on the arsenal uh, at Harper's Ferry. It's all this focus of America's attention on the issue of slavery. So the New Republican Party had been formed in 1854. We talked about that in the first lecture, you know, and they were formed to to oppose, to, to stop the spread of slavery. They thought it was a terrible institution, and, and it was bad enough that it was in the South already, but they were just, just going to do everything they could to keep it from spreading into the territories. So in 1854, they, they get a lot of popular support in the North and none in the South, basically. Um, what happens, though, when Lincoln gets the nod for the uh, the Republican Party to run for president, he promises that he's not going to abolish slavery in the South. Uh, that was not his platform. He was he didn't like the institution so much, but he wasn't going to he wasn't going to end everyone's way of life in the South. He felt there was a better way to handle that. So he promised that he would not abolish slavery uh, when he was elected. The issue arises, though, is that the South just didn't believe him. Uh, his party was vehemently against, just strongly against, uh, slavery, and, and they just, the, the South just, just knew, uh, that he would back out on that promise. Now, Lincoln is supposed to be one of the most, uh, sincere and honest presidents we've ever had, so the fact that he, he promised that he would not abolish slavery, you know, honestly, I've gotta believe the guy. Uh, the path that we get that we get set on with his election is going to lead to the Civil War. Um, the South was was kind of back into a corner here. They they just now that they had lost the equality in the legislature, and, and now that they have an incoming Republican president or the option, the ability for a Republican president to come in. They, they, they see the writing on the wall, so to speak, that slavery is going to be attacked yet again. And, and they just, there's just no recourse for them in the courts or in Congress anymore. So, Lincoln is going to win the election of 1860. He's going to win the popular vote, win the electoral vote, uh, and, and he's going to become president. As this happens, um, South Carolina, is going to have an issue with it now. In in Lincoln in Lincoln's campaign, when he's when he's running for president, he's, he's telling people what he stands for. Uh, he has a letter writing campaign, and, and he writes to the editors of large newspapers, excuse me, so they can print his position. And I want you to read this real carefully, and I'll read it to you, but really pay attention to what he says. And this is straight from Abraham Lincoln. This is a direct quote. Uh, and he writes to Horace Greeley, and he says, Look, my paramount object in this struggle, my, my focus, is to save the Union, and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. Uh, Lincoln is focused on maintaining the United States as a whole. It's not about what his views are on slavery. He's going to do what he has to do to solidify and, and to protect these United States. 
so he goes on to say, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. Um, and if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others, I would also do that. Uh, Lincoln is saying, look, it's slavery, if it's going to tear apart the nation, I will do anything involved with slavery to save the nation as a whole. Um, that's very important. Read that red again. Read, think about what he's saying. Um, he ends his note with, uh, what I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because it helps to save the union. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was, was focused on the protection of the United States. He felt that, that a nation divided, like we were, um, north and south, anti-slave and slave, that, that we just couldn't survive on the national stage or the international stage. So Lincoln promises to, to do whatever it takes, slave-wise, to maintain our union. And that means keep it, get rid of it, get rid of some of it. Like he, He's open to any option that actually protects the United States. Um, despite quotes like this, once Lincoln is elected, um, South Carolina, the, the birthplace of rebellion in the Americas, um, they straight up secede. One month after he's elected, South Carolina says, we are no longer part of the United States. See ya. Um, bye. That's it. Um, this time, South Carolina is going to be followed by 10 more states just in the next few months. Uh, so unlike the tariff crisis, right, the, the nullification crisis, where South Carolina kind of went out of the loan, and threatened to secede, but no one else kind of backed them up. In this case, South Carolina secedes, and ten more southern states join them really quickly. Um, the Union is officially dissolved at this point. Um, the South is, is now um, acting as their own country. Now, the the issue that the South is going to run into here uh, is is one of numbers. Okay, the population in 1860. Uh, the northern states, there's 22 million people living in the north. There's 9.1 million people living in the south. And of those 9.1 million, 39% are slaves. So, you know, that you're going to whittle that number down again as to who can actually fight in the coming battles. Um, if you'll see, I like this cartoon because um, it, it kind of shows what happened here. Uh, you know, the South, I, I get that they were just fighting tooth and nail to maintain their way of life. What they knew, their economy was based on the slave labor plantation system. I mean, it just, they didn't know any other way uh, to succeed. To succeed. Uh, and so they succeeded. Um, and, and if you look at that cartoon, look, they're cutting off the branch that they're sitting on, right? They, they're going to fall themselves. So they're not going to split the union, which is the main branch, the main tree trunk. Um, they're, they're cutting off their branch to that union. Um, now at the time, the, this was not a foregone conclusion, right? The, the South was not destined to lose in a war um, just because of the numbers. And, and next unit, when we get to it, uh, probably next week sometime, you're going to see that, that initially, especially, man, the South is going to rock the, the Northern forces in the field of battle, uh, despite the smaller number and, and lesser arms and all kinds of things that they were overcoming. Um, the fact that this cartoon is so, so important, though, it shows that in the end, the, no matter how brilliantly their generals fought, no matter how passionate their soldiers were, no matter what happened, um, they were facing overwhelming odds from the very beginning. So just something to keep in mind. All right, now with South Carolina and the secession, that is going to end your sectionalism notes. Uh, remember, this whole packet here, uh, your next set of notes is Civil War, and it's, it's stapled together for those of you in class, or, or it's all one section for those of you doing it online at home. Uh, make sure you have them all completely filled out. You can always go back and listen to other lectures if you miss anything. The notes are vital vital to passing the test and getting good grades on the assignments. So make sure you are caught up on that. If you have any questions, let me know. Y'all have a great day.